Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start off by uh, just uh, asking, uh, tell us about how you came from uh, Sierra Leone uh, and uh, with very high expectations of British democracy and whether you think those expectations have been met. Um, when I was in Sierra Leone, living in Sierra Leone, uh, when I was born and grew up there, there was no democracy. You can't even protest. If you protest, you might get shot or you can get in prison. And we use theater in a form of protesting, where we sing songs and, and poems and go out to schools and colleges and kind of try to speak a little bit. But when you get to hear about Western democracy as an African, you really, really cherish that kind of democracy, that freedom, that ability to be able to influence your government and be able to challenge the politicians that represent you as a people. So to us as Africans, it was the most amazing form of system. And I always hope that I, would, I could live in such a system but of course in Africa it's impossible. <laughs> so the civil war came and all the destruction. So I, I thought, okay, the only place I could come to is England because I was part of the Commonwealth and Sierra Leone was uh, a British colony and uh, I had some relatives who helped me. So I was really happy to come over and, and, and live in a free world, you know. So I came here and I be living here, walking, and just to survive uh, as a student at that time. And then I didn't really get to know what's democracy even when I came to England because I was just busy walking and trying to survive. And all I saw was when there was elections, people can vote, and then the politicians will come in power, the wave our prime minister going in office. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's really great. People could vote, you know. They, everybody had a choice, and they, they could put whoever they think is good for their country in power. And I thought that was great. And I could only see that on TV or in the media. But eventually, I, when about a million or two million people took to the street to demonstrate against the war in Iraq, I thought, wow, this is a great thing. I'm going to go in the street, and for the first time in my life, I'm going to experience democracy in the street. So I was really excited. So uh, I took my little handheld camera, and I went out there, and you know, and it was amazing to see that many people, and, and it's just like fantastic. I was like, yeah, definitely the government is not going to go to war. Come on, look at all these people. You know, and then the violence that erupted that night with protesters and leading to even the November protest, which is a second protest, which was actually bigger than the first one, but no one actually talked about it. And I saw so much more violence with the reaction of the police uh, against the protesters, not even trying to understand the passion of these people, you know, and why they took to the street to protest. And, and that shocked me. As, as, an African, I was like, wow. In Africa, we thought life is so important here. Even even a finger can worth millions, you know? And someone's head got cracked up by the police and they don't do nothing, no ambulance. I was like, and they just tried to protest. So I thought, you know what? I really, really need to understand what this democracy is all about. So every time there's a protest, I go out in the street with my camera. So as you can see, over the years, the cameras evolved. So I keep just buying and investing and trying to get people to help me to make the film. But everyone that I told, spoke to about the film said, just keep away from me, <laughs> you know? So like these kind of films, no way. You know, I tried to get to the media to help me out. All the media rejected me. They, they actually told me plain. They said, look, we, we know how to make films. We, we are the professionals and we don't touch subjects like that. Who are you to touch it? You can't. You can't. You can't portray, you, you will just get branded. You will just, you will mess up your career, you know. So I thought, you know what, well, I'm just gonna do it myself. So over the years, you know, I decided to capture the story and, you know, try my best to tell it. So yeah, it, it was a journey, it was a shock, you know, and I'm still, I still don't think we have a democracy somehow, you know, because we went to war, many people died 
and, and, and up to now, you can see around the world what's happening. So, yeah. Um, Chester, what do you think that your film can tell audiences that mainstream media has failed to do? Well, the mainstream media failed to depict the passion of the protesters. That's the problem. They, they usually just show the violence and the smashing of the glass, you know. Sometimes they'll show a little bit, you know, they'll talk a little bit about, like, the, you see in, in the film, some newspaper did write, like, a million match, but maybe that's just one, one column and things like that. It's not been re repeated. The, the TVs don't even say anything much about, you know, the passion of the protester or, or, or the causes of the activists themselves. So basically what we think of protesters nowadays is just troublemakers in a way because people want to get on with their lives, they just wanted to cause trouble. So that's the media portray that. So in a way, my film is showing you the progression of the movement and how passionate the protesters were, their point of view, really. It's, it's from the protesters' point of view, I would say, because what we see, all the documentaries have been made, is from someone else's point of view, and, and we don't get to see the bigger picture. Well, I'd like to throw it open to the floor now. Are there any questions for Chester? Feel free, please, to... Do, do please feel free. Any question? No... Sorry. Um, okay, well, I, 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 I'll, uh, I, I would like to ask. I mean, t tell me, you got really close into the, the police, uh, in, in, right with your camera, right? You, there were some scenes there where there were some pretty, pretty, uh, you were very near some dangerous uh, situations. T tell us about how you felt filming that. Well, it was actually dangerous. Thanks to Jamie McFarlane, who is here. He was there with me, my assistant, who filmed some of that stuff as well. So we both went to the protest, and we had just one camera. So when things get really hot, you know, sometimes we exchange camera, and he goes. But it, it, it was scary, actually, to be there, because people are like, actually throwing bottles and stuff like that as well. And, and the police were really, really aggressive. But when you come from a country where you get threatened all the time with AK-47s and RPGs, a little baton means nothing to you, <laughs> really. So. Uh, it was terrifying from my point of view still, you know, just imagine people who've never experienced any violence before and being there for the first time, especially the young, you know, kids. So they, they were terrified, they were angry as well, you know. So yeah, it, it was a bit scary. And, and if you experience that, you're never going to go to a protest again, you know. Uh, of course, people do go to protest again, uh, don't they? Some pe uh, pe people, very brave people, will, will protest regardless, uh, regardless of the harassment. Um, tell me, Chester. Uh, how, so, what about the uh, the media? Um, the the way that you uh, that the media has portrayed these these issues and these events, uh, and your just tell us a bit more about your disappointment in that. In the way the media present yeah, their own part yeah, of the story. Yes, yes. Well, I, I'm really disappointed because we feed the media, we buy their papers, we we sponsor the media in a way, you know. And I sometimes think the media's responsibility is to tell the truth, you know, and be unbiased in a way. And because we are living in a democracy, and it's important for our media to be really truthful and not try to manipulate us. So sometimes when I see stories that they wrote, especially when you go to some protests, and I'm there, I'm filming the progression before the violence, and, and then I'll go home and I'll watch the TV because I was interested to see how they depict it or the newspapers, and all you see is the violence, you know, and you never, you think, ah, this has been manipulated because I was there. It was not like that. You know, so that was a disappointment in a way, thinking that are they not doing their jobs? You get me? Not all the media is like that. You know, don't get me wrong. There are some, you know, media out there who are actually trying and, and saying the truth, but there are few. You know, and I just think, is it a ploy to blank us out to make us not be aware of what's going on? So, because if we're not aware of what's going on, how can we make democratic choices when we go to voting elections? So that, that's, what, that's what disappointed me, really, because uh, as, as the film, Jim said, 
a democratic population supposed to be an educated population. If you're not educated properly about what's going on in your country, then you can't make democratic choices, you know. So that's what I thought. Any questions for Chester? Any more questions? Yes, yes, please, yes. I think so, yeah, because I'm a professional filmmaker, I went to film school and graduated 2007 and you know usually when you graduate from a really famous film school you, you gain the media, you gain the mainstream quickly, Not you don't have to struggle as much, but because of the stories I want to tell, then no one really wants to help me with these stories, commissioners don't try to engage with me. So in a way, it has damaged my career. I should be making money, some money now, because it's really hard for filmmakers to make money nowadays. But I should at least be earning a living. But what I'm doing is I'm actually spending my own money, loaning money, so I'm in debt, and just because I'm passionate to make the film. So in a way, that has dragged me down, and, and even trying to, after I finish the film, take it to acquisition in Channel 4, BBC, and say, hey, look, this is the film. Okay, they didn't give me money to make it, but I finished it. Can you take a look at it? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. And I call on Channel 4 acquisition, and they pick up and say, oh, I'm the director of War Matters. I sent you the film about two months ago. Um, did you get to see it? And she said, oh, War Matters? No, 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 not for us. Bam. So in a way, yeah, uh, it's not helping me uh, as a filmmaker to get, you know, the where where I want to get just because of the subjects I chose to, to, to do. I guess the next question doesn't really pertain to what you are doing. Well, in in the African tradition, they say once you fall in the sea, you have no choice but to swim. So <laughs> I'm swimming. <laughs> I'm looking for land. <laughs> yeah, I will because. Uh, I, it's a trilogy now because I'm trying to do three documentaries out of all the protest movements. One is War Matters, the other one deals with the student uprising, and the other one deals with the financial crisis. So I, I was in Belfast, uh, in, in Northern Ireland, trying to film the G8 summit and all that. And it, that was quite interesting. Yeah, but I'll, I'll continue to work. Hopefully once I finish the film, then I can, I can have my life back. Okay, there was, uh, yes. You, uh, the back, the man at the back. Yeah, in a way, your film shows quite a lot of the futility of protesting. And um, I wondered what, what, what you want to film. You want them to come away feeling like they could join you in the protest, or like, I wonder if you're interested to know what you, what you want to achieve in your film, and also how your, your opinions on kind of the film and the people who protest. Yeah, um, I don't know if when I was making the film or editing it that I had thought I wanted to make a film that when people see it, they would get angry, come out of the cinema and start protesting straight away. I was just trying to depict a story that I captured and trying to find the right structure to tell the story. And, and also just make it true to what it is. So I was not really thinking about, you know, creating a campaign kind of film that, that pr the protesters or campaigners will use to campaign. Though I wanted it to be like that, you know, that's why when, when I spoke earlier, you know, I've tried to approach different campaigners to even invite them to come. That's why you don't see none of the protesters here because the protesters themselves are so divided, they're fighting each other. And some of them in Parliament Square did fight each other, and it was really gruesome and ugly. And, and just because the government set them up, you know, because Brian Hall, he started a protest. And, and they told him, if you, are, you encourage other people to go on in the square, they will evict all of them. So he doesn't want that. And also he hated the fact that no one joined him when he was protesting. And now, in 2010, Everybody came in to protest, and so he didn't like, so there was a conflict within these protesters. And then when they caged Parliament Square, some of the protesters still want to come and join the protest, and Brown Hood was not happy about that. You 
<laughs> so, so because I put some people in the film that they don't like, some other protesters don't like, and they had conflict with, they want me to edit myself, like take them out, <laughs> and somehow like not agreeing with them being there because they had a conflict with them. So, so sometimes this is what I face, you know. Uh, I try to create, tell a story of a people, of a movement, but the people themselves who are in the movement are so divided, and it's, it's just the system, you know? So that's why I wanted them to come and join me together so we can take the film around the country and play. So that I, I want them to do that. So it's tricky at the moment. One of the protesters, they don't email me anymore and all that stuff. So I'm trying to use another tactic to see how I can engage them, you know, so we can all you know, so they can have the film and they can play when they want because it's their film. It's about their lives. It's about their struggle. You know, so hopefully we can take it out there. But I plan to take it myself around the country, organize community screenings and play the film and, and get or schools or colleges, whatever it takes. I really want to put a film out there. Before this, this screening, I sent a lot of press release. You did as, you know, as well to the newspapers about this film, write a nice story, you know, but nobody responded. They don't care. No, nobody cared about it. So, in a way, yes, that's part of his damage in my career as well as a filmmaker, in a way. Um, just a, but do, 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 I hope you want to pick up the question on futility. Five minutes, yes. Oh, one more question. Okay, well, I'll throw it open to the floor then. Uh, uh, one last question for Chester. Well, I have one, which is, to pick up on the futility point, and do, do you think protest is futile? Uh, I don't think so, really, because protests do make a difference, in a way, because the politician, or it might be a negative difference or a positive difference. Well, I haven't seen the positive for a long time, but politicians and the leaders and the powerful still fear the people, and if we don't have the right to protest, then we'll have nothing to fight back against the ideological tyranny or <laughs> whoever is in power that we don't agree with. You know, a similar situations happening right now in Egypt. You know, so protest is important, but I don't know. It's not working anymore, though. You know, some some will form because the anti-war movement failed, and once that failed, I didn't. I don't see anything that succeeded. The student movement didn't succeed. The anti-capitalist movement or, or or the movement against the court didn't succeed. So I didn't see anything so far for the past 10 years that I've been pro following protests that have changed because of protests. Except Lewisham, they had a protest there, but that's small, it's minor. So the government can give that. They don't care about that. you know. But I, I don't know. Can, you, can someone tell me of a protest that have changed a big issue or anything at the moment in England? Well, I think, I might think the Iraq, uh, anti-Iraq war protests uh, did succeed in not in stopping the war but certainly in changing the uh, opinion so that the next time comes around uh, the governments are, are less likely because um, of, of uh, what, what has happened. Uh, I know a lot of people whose, whose minds were changed uh, by the sheer weight of protest against uh, the Iraq war uh, and I think there is now a, 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 a bulwark of anti-war feeling in this country, which will uh, influence future decisions by government. So uh, I, I would, I'm not as pessimistic as you, Chester. Well, I, I, I hope so. I do hope so. It's, it's, all, it's for our children now, I think, maybe, because maybe we can change it later. But we said after that, people, they've gone to Libya, you know, they've gone to all these other countries. Now they want to arm Syria. You know, so they're still cooking up wars around the world, and we can't stop them. They're too big, they're too powerful, they've got lots of money, you know. So, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe there's hope for the future, but not for now. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.